Josie, please. Okay. Uh, thanks. And in this moment, I'm very happy to introduce the speak Igor Chaga Santos from Universidade Federal de Sergipe, that will talk about the Blast Learning Congress from a Singularity Theory viewpoint. So thank you very, very much, Igor. And you may start your talk now. Hey, thank you, Deborah. And thank you for my colleagues from the organizing committee to allow me to talk here today. It's my pleasure to be here. And so, uh, as Deborah said, I'm talking about Blush Line Congress from a Singularity Theory viewpoint. Um, the idea is just to study a little bit about the Blush vector field and um, using two different viewpoints inside of the Singularity Theory viewpoint. So, uh, the first viewpoint is we look at uh, at the line congruence as a smooth map. Uh, considering the case of three parameters in R4, and then we classify the singularities of the, this map. And the second viewpoint, we look uh, at the line congruence, uh, at this kind of line congruence, considering the frontals, and we try to define a vector field for frontals that plays uh, the same role as the blush vector field for the regular case. And so in the, in the first, Viewpoint, we work um, in the first half of the, of the presentation, uh, the case of three parameter line congruence in R4. For the second half of the presentation, we go to the, to the co dimension one case in R3. Uh, so, I, part of this is a joint work with Deborah Lopes and Maria Parecida Ruas. Okay, so in a brief introduction. Uh, the study of two parameter line congruence in R3 started. Uh, uh, with Gaspar Monge around 1776. Monge was uh, one of the first authors to discuss this kind of object. Um, he discussed some, some properties and also some, some results, but without proof. And after Monge, uh, around 1859, uh, the mathematician Ernest Kummer appeared with the, was the first to deal with a general theory for line congruence, um, the theory known now as the Kummer's theory for line congruence. And in recent decades, the, the, the subject achieved an important development, uh, in, mainly considering the case of uh, the viewpoints from the affine differential geometry, uh, especially the Blaschk normal congruence, uh, and also with the singularity theory viewpoint. Uh, in this case, the, the goal is classif uh, it's classify singularities of uh, line congruence. So we look at the line congruence as a smooth map, and then we try to classify the singularities in the general case, the normal case, and if we take the affine case, for instance, uh, inside the PFN case, it's included also uh, the Blush normal case here. So we have several authors here like uh, Max Kreise, Martin Barajas, Ronald Garcia, Saji, uh, uh, Isonia, Takeuchi, uh, Samuel, Samuel Paulino, Luciana Martins, uh, so um, a lot of names. Um, so I will start with the case of singularities of three-parameter line congruence in R4. So uh, our motivation, we started this study uh, a few years ago, reading this paper by Zunia, Saiji, and Takeuchi, singularities of line congruence. Uh, it's a paper from 2003. Here they classified singularities uh, considering the case of two, of, uh, two parameters in R3. And, and they presented uh, this conjecture here. Uh, gems of flash affine normal congruence at any points are other than stable. So in, the, the, in this first half of my presentation, my goal is to show, uh, is to provide a positive answer to this conjecture here. So in order to start, let's define formally what is a line congruence. So uh, three-parameter line congruence in R4 
is nothing but a, a two parameter family of lines in R4. So locally, this is represented by a smooth map FXC defined here, uh, where U is an open subset of R3 and I is an open interval. And it's given by this expression here. So if you fix U here as a parameter, then you have a, a line passing through the point at U in the direction CU. Uh, here, X and C are smooth maps. Uh, we call C the uh, reference hypersurface of the congruence. And C is, uh, is also smooth and different than zero, and it's called the direct hypersurface of the congruence. Not that in this definition, we, not, we are not asking X and C to be emerging. So they may have singularities in the general case, but for some case of line congruence, we need to to make some restrictions, like the blush case, for example, when we are considering non-degenerate hypersurface and C as its blush vector field. Um, as we want to classify singularities, it seems good to, to know something about the singular points of this map. So we can show that the singular points of a line congruence F, X, C are the points U, T, satisfying this equation here and the proof is not in the hard because we just need to take the Jacobian matrix of F that is this four by four matrix and then uh, we calculate the determinant equal to zero and from this we obtain this expression here and just using the properties of the inner product and cross product we we can go from this to this expression here Okay, uh, with this, it's okay, then we can go now uh, for the case we want. So we want to study the blush line congruence. So it's good to study before this uh, a little bit about the geometry of affine immersions, at least some basic results. So we take R4 with volume element given by this. And we take D, uh, the standard connection on R4. X uh, regular hypersurface with image M, and we take C uh, uh, a vector field transversal to M. The, this means that C does not belong to the tangent space of M at any point. So since we have this, we can decompose R4 in these two uh, components here. So R4 is the direct sum of the tangent space of M at P, where P is given by X U, and direct sum with the vector space generated by this vector, uh, the vector C U. And then if we take, for instance, X and Y, uh, capital X and N Y vector fields on M, then we can decompose the derivative of Y in the direction X into a tangent component and a transversal component um, here, the tangent component, uh, this nabla, is an affine connection that we call the induced affine connection, induced by C on M. And here, uh, on the transversal component, we have C, that, uh, that we call the affine fundamental form induced by C on M, uh, which defines a symmetric bilinear form on each tangent space of M. And this name is because if we if we take here uh, the transversal vector field being the unique normal vector field, uh, we obtain here the second fundamental form of, the, of a regular surface, hypersurface. And, and we can also show that if we take two different transversal vector fields, uh, then they, they are fine fundamental forms. They, they are related, uh, actually one is the other one multiplied by a, a smooth function and a non-zero smooth function. And then for, for this, we can we obtain that one is non-degenerate if and only if the other one is non-degenerate. And this is the motivation for this definition here. So we say that a regular hypersurface M is non-degenerate if its Gaussian curvature never vanishes. And this is because the, if you take here the unique normal vector field, uh, the second fundamental form being non-degenerate is the equivalent to take, uh, to say that the Gaussian curvature is different than zero, as you like. 
Okay, uh, we can also do something like this, considering the, the, der the derivative of sin into a tangent direction x, and then we decompose this into a tangent component and a transversal component. Here uh, on the tangent component, we have uh, this operator S, and uh, this is a operator, a linear operator on each tangent space of M that we call the shape operator of C. And here is tau is the transversal connection form associated to, to the vector field C and to M. And we say that this vector field C is equiaffine when uh, when this transversal connection form is identically zero, um, which means that uh, the derivative of C into a tangent direction is tangent to M. Uh, a classical example of an equiaffine vector field associated to a regular surface, hypersurface, is the unique normal vector field, as we know. And at last we can, using the volume element on, on R, in R4, we can induce a volume element on M uh, like this. So we take that uh, uh, XYZ equal, equals to omega XYZ and C uh, on the fourth coordinate. And okay, since we have all this, we are now able to define what is the Blush vector field or the affine normal vector field of uh, a non degenerate uh, hypersurface. So, but let we need to remark this uh, if we take a non degenerate hypersurface and, and a transversal vector field, uh, we know that the, the affine fundamental form is non degenerate. So, it, this can then be treated as a non-degenerate metric on N, because it's a, on each tangent space, it's a bilinear map. So the important here is that if it's a non-degenerate metric, there is a volume element associated. Uh, then using this, we define the Blush vector field of a non-degenerate hypersurface as a transversal vector field, C, satisfying these two conditions here. So C needs to be equiaffine, and the induced volume element theta induced by C coincides with the volume element uh, omega C of the, the non generic metric C. Uh, we can show that this vector field is unique up to sign, and it's also an equiaffine invariant uh, uh, for a non generic hypersurface. And since we have this, uh, we have all we need to, to proceed. So, as I, as I said, our idea is to classify singularities of blushed line points. So I want to look at, at line congruence at xc, where x is non-degenerate and c is its blushed vector field. But for this, uh, uh, our idea is, is to use the same approach that was used to classify singularities of normal line points. So we need a family uh, of affine support functions in order to do this. So in this first part, for real, my approach view, it's, kind, it's more general because I'm not rest, uh, restricted to the case of the Blush vector field. I will consider just X non-degenerate and C equiaffine. And then we take, since we are all I, considering all I have said until now, if we take P a point in R4 and U a point in this open subset of R3, then we can decompose P minus XU into a tangent component and a transversal component, like this. In here, uh, in this, on the transversal component, uh, we have this function, rho P, that is a smooth function called uh, an affine support function associated to M and C. If we, to, if we take P as a parameter, then we have a family of affine support functions here. And, uh, and using this family of affine support functions, uh, if we have X non-degenerate and C an equiaffine transversal vector field, then we can show that an affine, each affine support function for P has a critical point at U if and only if P uh, minus 
xu is a multiple of cu, just like the, the case for the normal vector field, for the unique normal vector field. And using this proposition, we obtain the catastrophe set of the family of affine support functions who, uh, that is given by this. So the catastrophe, the catastrophe set is given by the pairs up, where p is written as xu plus tcu. So it's a very, it's a well-known expression because it is exactly the, the expression I, for the uh, the line points associated to x and c. And then since we have this, we can prove uh, in this proposition here that uh, every time you take x non-degenerate and see an AP-affine transverse vector field, then the family of Jarmdorf functions hold, the family of affine support functions, uh, the germ of, of family of affine support function is a Morse family of functions. And but why is this so important? This is important because, as I mentioned before, the conjecture uh, the conjecture talks about uh, Lagrangian singulars and most families. Uh, it's like uh, it's the door we need to open in order to talk about uh, Lagrangian singulars, because since we have this as a Morse family of functions. Then we know from the theory of Lagrangian singularities that uh, associated to every to all Morse family we have uh, a Lagrangian immersion uh, that is defined on the catastrophe set of the family, uh, and then in this case it's given by this because in, in this first coordinates here we have the parameter uh, on the catastrophe set, and here the derivative relative to the parameter. And associated to a Lagrangian immersion, we have a Lagrangian map uh, that is the projection on the parameter set. So the Lagrangian map associated to this to this family is exactly the the line congruence associated to the pair x c, where x is a non-degenerate surface hypersurface, and c is the it's a nuclear vector field associated to. So from, from all of this, we know that the, the singularity associated to, to line congruence uh, given by, the, by a pair x, c, where x is not degenerate and c is equiaffine, the singularities are, are Lagrangian. So from now on, I will show that if you restrict this to the case where c is not only equiaffine, but the Blaschke vector field of x, then these singular, singularities Generically, they they are uh, the Lagrangian stable singularities. Uh, so, how do we do this? Uh, let's denote by this the space of non-degenerate regular hypersurface with the witness infinite topology. Let's also define this the space of the Blasch exact normal congruence as this space here. So given by the pairs x c, uh, where x is a non-degenerate hypersurface, and c is its Blaschke normal vector field. Uh, and then we can show that for a residual subset of non-degenerate hypersurface in R four, the family whole of affine support functions is locally R plus versa. But why is this important? Because we know from the theory of Lagrangian singularities that if, a, if, the, if the Morse family is R plus Bursal, uh, then uh, the Lagrangian map associated is Lagrangian stable. Actually, this is an if and only if. And then since we have, uh, we have this, we can obtain this theorem here, uh, which asserts that for a residual subset of uh, in the space of non-degenerate hypersurface in R4, the germ of uh, Blasch exact normal congruence f x p c at any point u0 zero t0 zero is a Lagrangian stable map germ for any x taken in O. That is, uh, for all x taken in O, f x p c is an immersion or equivalent to one of these normal forms here. 
these are the Lagrangian stable singularities. So we have fold, cusp, solitario, butterfly, or one of the umbilics, the elliptic, hyperbolic, or parabolic. And with this theorem, actually we can uh, obtain a uh, corollary from this theorem uh, that is just, it's the same statement, but here we change the, we, we take a residual subset uh, in this space here, in the space of flash exact normal convex. But this is enough to, to give uh, an answer to the conjecture predicted by Uzumi, Asagi, and Takeuchi. Uh, with this theorem, we provide a positive answer to the conjecture. So, in fact, these singularities are generically the Lagrangian stable singularities. The singularities of Blash exact, exact normal congruence are the Lagrangian stable generically. And, okay, this, uh, I, I showed this, but I, I just would like just to mention some other results we obtained in the same. In this, uh, in this paper, because uh, we also classified singularities in the general case, singularities of the parameter line congruence in R4 in the general case. That is, when we take X and C and pairs without restrictions. Uh, so we showed that there is an open dense set uh, oh, in this space with the witness infinite topology such that uh, for all X, C, uh, the term of line congruence at x to c at any point e0 to 0 is stable. And we also showed that for all x to c taken in O, the term of line congruence at x to c at any point e0 to 0 is a one parameter versus one folding of a germ from R3 to R3. And then f x to c is a equivalent to one of these normal forms here. These are the Lagrangian, oh, sorry, the stable singularities in the usual sense, but some of these normal forms here are A equivalent in R4, but we decided to, to maintain here uh, all of these because they came from germs from R3 to R3 that are not A equivalent. So we decided to, to keep this list a little bit long, longer because of this. And also because we are studying now the a geometric interpretation of this, and we maybe there's something curious or interesting about this. And so it was a we should we thought this could be good to keep this here. And we also studied the case of normal congruence. Uh, it's good to define formally what is a, a normal congruence. Uh, so a, a three parameter line congruence, it's a is said to be a normal congruence. A three parameter line congruence given by the pair x c is said to be normal if for each point u0 there is a neighborhood u tilde of u0 in the regular hypersurface given like this. So it's a hypersurface that you will be then walking through the lines of your line congruence and whose normal vector fields are parallel to xu for all you taken in u tilde. And we say that this congruence is an exact uh, normal congruence if we start from with a pair x c for which c is normal to, to x. And we have this proposition that's just uh, a version of, of proposition gave by Izumiya Sagi Takeuchi and also gave by Kume. Uh, uh, that characterize normal line congruence. So we say that uh, a congruence given by, given by x c is normal if and only if these coefficients here h i j and h j i are equal uh, where they define by this. So h i j is this inner product of the partial derivative of x relative to u i and this derivative here relative to uj. So, um, taking this into consideration, we denote by this, by n, the space of the normal congruence with the witness infinite topology induced by the topology here. And then we obtain this theorem here. Uh, 
which asserts that for there is a, an open dense set for prime in the space of normal line congruence such that the germ of normal congruence at x c at any point is Lagrangian stable map germ for any x c taken in O prime. That is, for all x c taken in O prime, f x c is an immersive germ O a equivalent to one of these normal forms here. These are the same normal forms that I showed in the case of Lagrangian singularities. Uh, in the case of, sorry, in the case of blush climb points, so because these are the Lagrangian stable singularities. And then with this, I, I, I finished the, the, the first part of the first half of my, my presentation. So I will stop talking about the case of in R4, and then I go to the case of co-dimension one in R3 to discuss the case of frontals and find normal vector fields. So my idea it's obtained for frontals, or at least for a class of frontals, uh, a vector field that plays the same role as the, the blast vector field in the regular case. So it's good to uh, at least understand a little bit about frontals and state some notation. Uh, so a frontal uh, it's, a small, uh, it's a small map X defined on an open source set of R2 uh, for which for all point Q taken in U there is a vector field N defined in, in an open neighborhood of Q such that this vector field is unitary and the partial derivatives of X are perpendicular to this vector field. Uh, we call this vector field a uh, unique normal vector field along X. Uh, an important class of frontals we, <coughs> we're going to use here is the class of uh, wave fronts. We say that a frontal X is a wave front if this map Xn is an immersion for all point Q taken in U. And uh, here I'm considering mainly uh, what we call proper frontals, uh, that is a uh, frontals X for which the singular set uh, has empty interior. Uh, and this is equivalent to say that the set of regular points uh, is an open dense set in U. Uh, I'm using here the, the approach of for frontals using uh, considering moving tangent moving bases as the approach given by to Medina Ferreira in his thesis. And so in order to understand this, let's understand first what is a moving basis uh, for uh, first. So we call moving basis a smooth map omega defined on an open subset of R2 with image in the space of three by two matrices uh, in which the columns W1 and W2 of the matrix omega are linearly independent vector fields. And when we put a moving base together with a frontal X in a way that the partial derivatives of this of X belong to the, to the plane generated by the, the columns of the moving base, we say that this moving base is actually a tangent moving basis of the frontal X. And then, since we have this, we, uh, I think it's good to show here this proposition uh, uh, by Medina Tejeda. Uh, in this proposition, he characterized frontals in terms of uh, tangent moving base. So basically, he showed that if X, X is a frontal, if and only if, for all point Q taken in U, there are smooth maps omega uh, in the space of three by two matrices and capital lambda in the space of two by two matrices uh, where hunk of omega is equal to two. And in a way that the, you can decompose the differential of X as this product here. So you take <coughs> uh, the differential of X is given by omega uh, and uh, time the, the transpose of this matrix lambda here. 
And since we are taking here in this decomposition omega has had two, uh, of course here omega it, it plays the uh, it works as a tangent moving base uh, for x. Uh, we can we can write the singular set of x as this this set here, where this function uh, lambda omega here is the determinant of capital lambda. So this is this is basically uh, the notation I will keep until the end of this presentation. And since we have all this, let's take x a frontal and omega uh, a tangent moving basis of x in the unique normal vector field induced by omega. And then we set these two matrices here, uh, the I omega matrix uh, with coefficients E omega, uh, F omega, F and G omega, all capital letters. So E omega here is given, they are basically given by the inner product of the vectors taken in the tangent moving base. So e omega is W1, W1, F omega W1, W2, and G omega W2, W2. And we also need this second matrix here in its coefficients, uh, E omega, F1 omega, F2 omega, and G, and G omega. These coefficients are given by the inner product of the vectors uh, from the tangent moving basis and the partial derivatives of the unique normal vector field. So of course, these two matrices plays. Uh, they try to pretend be. They pretending to be the first and second fundamental forms for for this case. We call usually we call the these matrices uh, the relative forms. Relative because they relative to the to a tangent moving base. If you change the tangent moving base, then you change these expressions here. And okay. And then with this, we can start studying uh, first if we are finding structure on frontals. So in, uh, let's take C, a vector field that is transversal to a frontal X. By transversal, I mean that CQ does not belong to the plane T omega Q, uh, where this is the plane generated by the vectors W1, Q and W2Q taken from the tangent moving base, omega. And then if we have this, we can decompose R3 as this direct sum here. So we take T omega Q, direct sum with the vector space generated by CQ. And then uh, we now we try to do something similar uh, to the to the so that the composition we, we, we had for the case of uh, today regular case before. So, but now we take the vectors, uh, these vector fields uh, on the tangent moving base, and we look at the partial derivatives. So we can decompose them. The WIUJ as a, into a tangent component in a transversal component. So here in the tangent component, we have the, I mean, I, I'm, I'm saying tangent because they belong, it belongs to the limiting tangent plane associated. So we have coefficients d, i, j, k, and in this transversal component, we have coefficients h, i, j. So similarly, we can take the partial derivatives of the vector field C, and again, we decompose this into a, this component on the limiting tangent plane and a transversal component. And then uh, here coefficients as S i j and coefficients tau i here. And we say that this vector field C is an equi-affine vector field or defines an equi-affine structure on X when its partial derivatives belong to the plane T omega Q for all Q. It's equivalent to say that these coefficients tau i here, they are identically zero. 
And in this case, uh, we say that the APR fine structure def uh, defined by C on X, uh, it's given by the symbols E, I, J, K, and H, I, J that I showed here in the expression. Okay, um, just a minute. And since we have all this, all this done, then we can now uh, go to the Blush vector field of a proper that I will define in the more natural way. So we take X uh, a, pro a proper frontal uh, for which the Gaussian curvature never vanishes on the regular part. So we say that a transversal vector field C uh, is the Blush vector field of F of X if it's a smooth extension of the usual Blush vector field defined on the regular part. Uh, of course, we can show that if we have this, if we have a frontal and the Blush vector field exists, then it's unique and it's also an equifying variant for this frontal. But uh, the first thing we we realize that this is not uh, it's not always true that the you can find uh, frontals that in the regular part they have a blush, but you cannot extend the, the blush to the whole domain. So then we needed to find a characterization of frontals for which it's possible to define a blush vector field. Uh, so in this theorem, we have this. Um, uh, a frontal X uh, then admits a blush vector field if and only if its Gaussian curvature K has an invention extension to the to U, and there are smooth maps A and B such that this expression here is satisfied, and here omega is a tangent moving basis uh, of X, and this function phi is given by this, where K here is the extension of the Gaussian curvature. And here there is a sketch of proof, so at least an idea on how prove this. Uh, if, we, if we write C uh, like this, so a component on N and a component on the limited tangent plane, and if we denote by C tilde the affine fundamental form induced by the unique normal vector field on the regular part, so I mean C tilde is obtained when we take this decomposition here, then we know that C tilde is the second fundamental form on the regular part. And if theta tilde is the volume element induced by the unique normal vector field N, then one can show that theta, where theta is the volume element induced by C, is related to theta tilde by this expression here on the regular part. And furthermore, if we denote by like this, the determinant of the matrix Cij, when we take a unimodular basis relative to this volume element theta, then this determinant here is associated to this, to the, this determinant. Here is the determinant of C tilde Ij when we take a unimodular basis associated to theta tilde, uh, like this, uh, with p to a, phi to a minus four. And, but then it's also possible to show that the condition theta equals to omega c, that is the first condition to the second condition I showed to be the blush vector field, that is uh, that the volume element is equal to the volume element associated to the non degenerate matrix C. This condition is equivalent to have this, the modulo of this determinant here being equal to 1. Then we just need to take the function of phi to be uh, here, to be like this. So k to the modulo of k. But then as we take in here a uh, proper frontal, uh, actually, actually, as I'm considering a frontal which admits a blush vector field, this is defined in the whole domain. So this means that it can extend the, the Gaussian curvature to, the, to, to you. And for the for this part here on the limited tangent plane, we need to use the fact that the vector field is equifying. So uh, we take here, <clears throat> if we decompose the partial derivatives of the vectors 
from the tangent moving base into a considering the transversal component given by C and given by N, then we have coefficients here HIJ and PIJ. And we can prove that HIJ is equal to PIJ uh, to this expression here involving PIJ and the function phi. And from this, we obtain that the, the coefficients tau i are given like this. But since C is a clear final, this, this coefficient needs to be equals to zero. And if there is zero from this, we obtain that A and B uh, need to satisfy a condition like this. And using also here the fact that the, the frontal, it's, it's really important to use the fact that the frontal is a proper frontal. And then we show this, this theorem. But um, then we need to find examples. And the first question up here, where to look for examples? Uh, and this was actually the important problem while we were doing this. And reading this paper by Medina Tejera uh, about some classes of frontals and its representation formulas, and here we found uh, two classes of frontals for which we, we could find a Blasch vector field. Uh, the class of frontals with extendable normal curvature and the class of wave fronts with extendable Gaussian curvature. So inside of these two classes, we could find the same. Uh, and take into consideration this first class, for instance, uh, we have this example here, uh, the frontal given by this, discussed the cross cap here, uh, defined here. And this is a frontal with extendable normal curvature for which the Gaussian curvature admits a smooth non-vanishing extension. And here's the, the picture of this frontal. Uh, it's important to see, it's like a cusp of cross cap. And here's the expression for the Blasch vector field in this case. Um, where ho is given here, and the expression for x1, c2, and c3 are given here. This is quite a complicated example as a first example of, of flash vector field, but I, 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 I think I thought this could be good to put here because I haven't mentioned until now, but maybe some of you noticed this. Uh, when we take a, a frontal, in an equi-affine transversal vector field to a frontal. This equi-affine vector field uh, provides also a frontal. It's also a frontal because the partial derivatives belong to the limited tangent plane. So the unique normal vector field of the initial frontal placed, uh, it works as a unique normal vector field for this equi-affine vector field seen as a frontal. And then, since we have this, um, some questions appear. For, for instance, uh, it's true, uh, some properties of the initial frontal are kept by its Blasch vector field. For instance, if the, if the frontal, the initial frontal is, is proper, it's true that the Blasch vector field is also a proper frontal. And we notice that this is not true, not always true, but this in this example, this is true. Uh, and then we we have a, a, a other works uh, and we can apply, for instance, a theory that we were studying up, uh, about line congruence involving singular surface. We could apply this case there. So in this case, the Blasch vector field is quite complicated, but it's also a proper frontal. And then look look at the second class of wave front with extendable normal curvature. Uh, I need to mention this representation formula here, given by Medina de Heer. And he showed that uh, if you take a wave front X uh, of hunk one, then up to an isometry and X is R equivalent to an expression like this, to this representation formula here, where H here is a smooth function. And more than this, uh, he showed that every time that the function, the smooth function A satisfies this PDE here, where C is a smooth function, 
then y is away in front of hand one with extendable Gaussian curvature. And more than this, the extension of the Gaussian curvature is given by this expression here. So for instance, if we want to extend the Gaussian curvature in a way that is non-vanishing, then we just need to take here C as a non-vanishing smooth function. And for instance, I have this case here. Uh, this, this way front uh, is a wave front of hand one for which the Gaussian curvature admits a non-vanishing extension. And the extension is given by this. So in this case, the function C was taken as one. And the blush factor field in this case is given by 0, 0, 1, so it's constant. So it's also, uh, this is also an important example because uh, on the regular case, uh, the case of surface with a constant blush vector field, it's, it defines a, a special class of surface called uh, improper affine spheres. In this case, we are obtaining here uh, improper affine spheres with singularities. Uh, and also, we observe that every time we take here H as smooth function satisfying this PD, and we take C as a constant, every time we take C as a constant, we have the, we obtain a, a wave front of hand one that is an improper affine sphere, improper affine sphere. So the blush vector field is constant. So inside of this class, we found a subclass. Uh, only with uh, improper affine spheres with singularities. That is uh, an important subject uh, in differential geometry. Some authors are interested uh, on this, uh, like uh, Max Kreise, Wojtek Dimitris, and Pedro Hughes, uh, and also Martinez. Uh, I think this paper by Martinez was the first one to talk about improper affine spheres with singularities that he called here improper affine maps. And this also, I haven't studied a lot about this, but it's something I would love to, to study a little bit more in the future. And, and now, I, oh, here's the picture of this last wave front. Now I will discuss something that I, I, I just like, I would like to mention this to show not to, I'm not giving many details about this because it's quite complicated, it's a lot of notation. Uh, but I think it's it's good to show this as an application of this, this theory that I, should, that I have just showed. So this is a version of the fundamental theorem of affine differential geometry for the case of frontals. Uh, the approach is it's based on the approach uh, given by Medina Tejeda for his fundamental theorem for the case of frontals, uh, but in the Euclidean case. And so let's take uh, gamma tilde A, I, J, K, E, J, I, E, F, G, phi smooth functions and phi different than zero. Let's also suppose that C, I, J is given like this and S, I, J like this, where all the components of these matrices here are seen as smooth functions defined on an open subset U of R2. And let's denote by lambda omega the determinant of the matrix capital lambda. Uh, and let's suppose that lambda, capital lambda is given like this. And let's suppose that uh, this set here is a dense set in E. Uh, suppose also that the compatibility equations for this system here are satisfied in, the, in this set. And let's also suppose that these two conditions these quite complicated conditions here, uh, quite complicated to read, are satisfied. And uh, here, this means the principal idea generated by the function lambda omega in this ring. Then we should have all of this, all this. We, we show that for each point Q, uh, there is a neighborhood V, a frontal X defined uh, on V, uh, with tangent moving basis, with a tangent moving basis omega, such that the differential of x is decomposed like this. In an equiaffine transversal vector field C, with associated equiaffine structure given by D1 in this matrix D1, D2, and Hij. 
where D1 and D2 are the unique smooth extension of these maps here, respectively, to U. And more than this, if we suppose that the condition, this condition here, Pg minus R to the square, is different than zero, is satisfied in the regular part, and that the condition, uh, this condition of parallel volume element is satisfied in the regular part, where nabla is the connection associated to the symbols, to these symbols here, and omega c is the volume element induced by the affine fundamental form c, then there is a volume element omega in R3, such that for this, taking this volume element in consideration, the, the vector field C is the blush vector field of the frontal X. And also, also we can show that if U is connected, and we suppose X tilde another frontal with C tilde, if we find transversal vector field and omega tilde tangent moving basis with the same structure obtained in A, then X and C tilde are finely equivalent. So we have this uniqueness in the sense of affine equivalence. Um, so basically this was what I would like to talk today. Uh, here are some of the reference. Here is the paper by Sumia Sajin Takeuch. That was our initial point. Uh, and on this paper, you can, you can find the results of the first part of, the, of my presentation. And in this preprint here, you can find the results on the second half of my presentation. Uh, I believe in the next days I will upload a, a new version of this. And this is, thank you for your attention. Thank you for your time.